Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the false confessions. I'll talk about the different types that there are, what the risk factors are for false confessions occurring. I'll talk about the Reed's technique, which is the most common police interrogation strategy in North America and how that relates to the likelihood of false confessions. And then lastly, some recommendations for minimizing the chances of false confessions. So we'll start with a definition. What is a false confession? It's when a confession is elicited in response to a demand for a confession, and it's either intentionally fabricated or not based on the actual knowledge of facts of what really happened. Before I go on, um, a show of hands, how many of you think under no circumstances would you ever confess to a crime that you didn't commit? Okay, and then show of hands if under some circumstances you think maybe you could confess to a crime you didn't commit. Okay, so it looks like 50-50, okay. Which is not like um, the general public, by the way. If we give out that question at random, both in the UK and in the US, nine out of 10 people say that they would never confess to a crime they didn't commit under any circumstances. Um, and the same is true for jurors as well. The majority of jurors think that under no circumstances would they confess to a crime that they didn't commit. Um, and so a confession is incredibly persuasive evidence at court, okay? Even if the defendant later claims that it was a false confession, if they later claim that um, it wasn't intentional, um, and even if there's evidence presented that there was some pressure during the police interrogation, some coercion. And even then, it's very persuasive evidence for, for jurors. Um, you know, so much so that once the police have a confession, they'll typically then end the investigation, okay? There's no real point then of investigating further because typically by that point, you can get a conviction. <clears throat> But in fact, false confessions do occur, okay? When we look at cases of wrongful imprisonment, okay, there was a false confession in 25% of them, okay? So we have a number of such cases at this point, okay? The Innocence Project alone has helped in nearly 350 cases at this point. Now, what the Innocence Project do is they do DNA testing on cases in which there wasn't initially the technology to do sufficient DNA testing, but now because of advancements in technology there are. And so they re-examine cases that are maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 years old. And then they find that actually the DNA proves this person is innocent and that someone else is guilty. So that's over 300 to 350 cases done by the Innocence Project. And 25% of those cases, there was a false confession. The National Registry of Exonerations in the US has over 3,000 cases at this point of exonerations. So this is people who were proven innocent and then exonerated and released from prison. Um, and again, in about 25% of the cases, there was a confession that was false. So it's not something that never happens. It is something that actually occurs more frequently than people realize. Now, detecting a false confession is unsurprisingly difficult, okay? Because lay people and jurors and even the police cannot tell the difference between a true confession and a false confession, okay? We'll talk about this more next time when we talk about detecting deception, okay? But we'll see that when at given, when people are given the choice to choose between whether one is telling the truth or a lie, they're pretty much no better than the flip of a coin, okay? It's about 50% success rate. It's not just true for police, and lay people, okay, but also for psychologists and trained professionals, the truth is that there's no one who's particularly great at detecting deception. So how might we determine if a confession is false? Well, if no crime has been committed, that's obviously one easy way of determining that it's a false confession. If there's scientific evidence that exonerates the confessor, so like I say, DNA evidence that then came to light proving that this person is actually innocent. Um, if the real perpetrator is actually apprehended, so what often happens in these cases of exonerations is that the real perpetrator is eventually apprehended, 
and they are already looking at a high sentence for the crimes that they've been caught for. And then they also confess to crimes that they got away with. Okay, and then this might lead to someone being released who was falsely imprisoned for that crime. And then maybe if other non-scientific evidence um, is put forward, you know, maybe witness statements um, or proof of an alibi, something such as this. So in the literature, there's really three different types of false confessions. Okay, I'll talk about them each in more detail separately, but just to give you the gist. The first is voluntary false confessions in which one volunteers a false confession. It's not in response to prompts or um, pressure or cohesion and um, coercion. Okay, the person is volunteering this um, false confession. The second one is coerced or pressured compliance, which is the most common type of false confession, um, in which one confesses during a police interrogation in response to external pressure, but they never believe that they're actually responsible, okay? We'll go on to talk about what some of the reasons might be, but it may be the case that they just want this interrogation process to end. They think it will be cleared up afterwards, or they might think it's their currently best avenue forward, but they don't believe themselves to be guilty, and they'll recant um, pretty much as soon as the interrogation is over, okay? But at some point during the interrogation, they'll give a false confession, okay? Now, traditionally, this was called coerced compliance false confession. But, you know, we're trying to engage the police in this um, line of research and these conversations. And, you know, by using the term coerced, it's, you know, implying that they've done something wrong. And so it's already in immediately getting them on the defensive. So the term pressured compliance is being more preferred in the literature. Um, and then lastly, coerced, pressured, internalized, okay, which is the most frightening of them. It's when one actually becomes convinced that they're responsible um, as a consequence of the police interrogation. Now, fortunately, this is also the rarest of the three. Now, before I go on to talk about voluntary false confessions, first of all, what reasons do you think there might be um, for someone, you know, coming forward voluntarily, confessing to a crime that they didn't actually commit? What might be some of the reasons for such a confession? Yeah. Yeah, trying to take the blame for someone else to protect someone else. Yeah, yeah. For attention, sure. Yeah, yeah, that happens. Yeah. Well, that would be like the second type um, in which they're being pressured by police. So, and for the first instance, I just want to talk about cases in which people are just voluntarily coming forward. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Maybe the actual perpetrator is blackmailing them, something like that. So, yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, maybe they're delusional would actually think that they did it. Yeah. That happens too. Yeah. Okay, great um answers. Um so Gudgeson suggests um four main reasons as to why one might voluntarily false confess false confess. Um so the first one someone basically said for attention, um some you know morbid desire for um you know what's the line in Chicago right if you can't be famous be infamous um Henry Lee Lucas also known as the confession killer when he was finally caught confessed to about 600 murders okay the vast majority of which you know couldn't be substantiated um but he was likely thinking if he's already going down for these crimes he might as well go down as the most you know prolific serial killer that there ever was if you like um the person may actually be unable to distinguish facts from fiction, which you also said that they might be delusional. Um, maybe relieving guilt guilt for something else that they've done wrong, okay, and that they feel as though they're deserving of some punishment and so that they're putting themselves forward 
um, to take responsibility for this. Um, or like the first answer said, um, to protect someone else. Um, now, voluntary false confessions are pretty rare, but they're more likely to occur in cases that are highly covered by the press and by the media. Okay. Um, so in the case of Charles Lingborough Jr., uh, when his child was kidnapped, um, there was over 200 people who came forward claiming responsibility. Okay. Um, obviously, not all actually guilty. Um, how many of you know the case of um, Jean Benet Ramsey? Yeah, quite a few of you. Yeah, it's quite popular on true crime podcasts and so on because it's pretty unusual and also quite unsettling case. But, um, you know, the child went missing, the parents called for help. And then the body was actually discovered in the basement of the of the parents' home. Um, it's a case that's you know never been solved. There was a lot of attention put on the parents, arguing that they were responsible, as is often the case in these sorts of cases. Um, but also a number of people falsely confessed to this. One of which was John Mark Carr. Um, but it was eventually proven that he was um, in Asia at the time of the of the crime. Okay, so obviously wasn't responsible. So what kind of person volunteers a false confession? Um, well, research suggests that those who are more actively involved in criminal activity are more likely to do so. So this might be connected to what some of the answers were saying that, you know, maybe they're in connection to the actual criminals and they're somehow putting pressure on them to come forward and take responsibility, or maybe they're blackmailing them or putting um, the pressure on their family or something such as that. Uh, those with a lessened grip on reality, okay, those who are maybe psychotic or delusional or experiencing some disassociative dis disorder in which they're not really able to tell the difference between fact and fiction. Um, and then some research has suggested also that those with OCD are more likely to falsely confess voluntarily. And then the most common type by far of false confessions is the coerced or pressured compliant false confessions. Um, so in these sorts of scenarios, you know, the individual is in a police interrogation. It's maybe went on for hours. And then eventually they falsely confess, um, maybe only briefly and then immediately recant. Or maybe they say so to end the interview, and then after the interview is over, they recant. But at some point during the interrogation, they falsely confess. Now, in these cases, there is usually evidence of police wrongdoing. This might mean colluding with expert witnesses, for example. Um, and then other cases of police maybe altering statements or suppressing evidence. You know, for the most part, in these cases, the police think that this person is guilty, that this person is responsible. And then maybe they're not following the procedures exactly because they want to make sure in their minds that justice is done. But obviously in these sorts of scenarios, that's when it's more likely that innocent people will actually be misidentified as being guilty and um, incorrectly imprisoned. There might also be false evidence put forward during the interrogation for the purposes of getting a confession. So I briefly touched upon this last time, but before I mentioned it, how many of you, by show of hands, knew that the police can lie to you about having evidence that they don't actually have? Okay. So maybe just less than half. Okay, so there is no law that says the police have to be truthful to you, okay? Sometimes in TV shows or whatever, there is this misconception that if you say to an undercover cop, are you a cop, they have to tell you, okay, that's actually not true, okay? Um, and they can say that they have evidence that they don't for getting the for the purposes of getting a confession. Okay, they can say that they have your DNA or your fingerprints or witness statements or whatever they want. Okay, there's no law that says they can't. Um, obviously, this can't be used at trial. Okay, as evidence to convict you. Okay, but the confession could be used at trial as evidence to convict you. Um, and the same is true for children. By the way, there are free states. In the country that have real that have laws that say the police can't lie to children. These are Illinois, Utah, and Oregon. Okay. In the other 47 states, police are also 
free to lie to children, or 50 states, they're free to lie to adults. Um, also, in these sorts of cases of false confessions, there's often poor interviews. So in many of these cases, the defendant is a minor or someone who has an intellectual disability, someone who isn't really fully aware over what the consequences might be over confessing, someone who should have an appropriate adult or a lawyer or someone with them. But in most of these cases of false confessions, they don't have anyone with them at all. Um, thankfully, these are much less common, but you know, historically, third degree tactics were often also used in order to get these sorts of confessions, which are basically, which is basically a polite way of saying torture, right, from beating and so on. Um, or one might want be wanting to avoid punishments, right? This could be the interrogation itself, if it's you know unsettling enough and going on for hours and hours and so on. But it also might be the case that, you know, if the police are telling you, we have this evidence, we have this evidence, we have this evidence, you're obviously going to be convicted, okay? You're looking at the death penalty. Your best bet is to just say that you did it and then get a lesser sentence, okay? If you actually think all of this evidence is against you, even though you know you're innocent, you might think, well, my best option is to just say that I'm guilty and to take the lesser sentence. Um, so it might also be in cases of a promise benefit. Um, some examples from the UK, the Birmingham Six, um, were accused of bombing a pub for the, a protest of Irish independence. Um, they were all found guilty. There was evidence of third degree tactics being used to get false confessions. Um, a number of them did confess, but then eventually were proven innocent. The Guildford Four is a similar case. And how many of you know the case of Brendan Dassey um, from Making a Murder on Netflix? No, okay. Well, that was like the biggest thing when it came out on Netflix, but I guess that was like seven years ago now. Um, but in the Netflix documentary, you can actually watch the police interview. Brendan Dassey is, you know, filmed guilty for the murder that's the subject of the documentary. Um, but there's a lot of debates over whether he's actually guilty or whether he's innocent. And certainly the police interview has been heavily scrutinized. Okay, this is someone who's clearly intellectually impaired. He's interrogated by the police without a lawyer or without an adult or anyone else. He's clearly not aware of the consequences. Okay, he thinks he's going back to school after he's confessed to murder. Okay, which tells you right there that he's not really fully aware over what the consequences are of what's happening. So some of the factors that make it more likely one will false confess, falsely confess as a consequence of this sort of pressure. Um, suggestibility, okay, is a trait referring to how vulnerable you are to leading questions to other people's opinions and shifting your own opinion under external pressure. Um, now, Gudgeson has a scale for measuring suggestibility, and we find that in lab studies that those who score higher on this scale are more likely to false confess in lab studies. I'll talk about how we study false confessions in the lab later. Obviously, it's very difficult to get good ecological validity in the lab, okay? But there are also then field studies. So for example, four of the Birmingham six falsely confessed, the other two did not. And the four who did confess scored higher on the scale than the two who didn't confess. Compliance is a separate but not completely unrelated term, referring to how adverse one is to conflict, how avoidant one is to conflict, and how eager one is to please and to be part of the group. So how vulnerable they are to peer pressure. So thinking back to those studies by Solomon Ash, right? Those who were highly compliant would give a wrong answer, even though they knew it, it was wrong, okay? Now, the difference between suggestibility and compliance is that with compliance, one knows that what they're saying is incorrect, okay? But they're doing so to comply with the authority figure or to comply with the group. With suggestibility, one might actually be cognitively confused and think that their information is incorrect and that this person knows best, okay? And that they're then 
um, kind of giving way to this person's um, superior knowledge. Now, suggestibility is a better predictor than compliance of vulnerability to false confessions, um, but compliance is still a significant predictor. And then fantasy proneness, okay? How prone one is to fantasy, again, might be associated with how likely one is to disassociate and to confuse fantasy with reality, and might actually then be at least briefly confused during the interrogation process. Also, those who score higher in anxiety, lower in self-esteem, more likely to false confess as a product of pressure, coercion. And the others are really all to do with a limited grasp on the consequences. Okay, so low IQ, a learning disability, some sort of mental illness, a low age. Okay, again, maybe not really realizing what's going to happen once you confess. Okay, you might think this interrogation is uncomfortable. I want to say what they want me to say to get it over with, not really thinking ahead over what's actually going to happen afterwards. Um, so I told you that in 25% of cases of wrongful imprisonment, there was a false confession. Well, in 35% of those cases, the person who falsely confessed um, was 18 years old or younger. Okay. And then um, Lindsay Malloy does a very good TED talk that you can look up um, on this topic, okay, of juveniles in the criminal justice system and their likelihood of confessing falsely. And then there are also situational factors that can increase the likelihood of confessing falsely. Um, so maximization, minimization techniques. The maximization techniques are essentially the bad cop routine and the bad cop, good cop routine. It's scare tactics, okay? It's maximizing the potential consequences of not confessing, maximizing the 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 nature of the crime in the defendant's mind. So again, going back to this idea that we have all this evidence against you, you're going to get the death penalty. You know, your best bet is to just confess, plead to a lesser sentence, and then you'll avoid the death penalty. That's a clear example of maximization. Minimization, on the other hand, is downplaying the nature of the crime. It's the good cop strategy and the good cop, bad cop routine. Building rapport, building rapport relating to the suspect, victim blaming. Okay, she was asking for it. I would have done the same thing. Okay, just help me get this case closed. Okay, just tell me that you did it. Nothing's gonna happen to you. Okay, acting as though the police is the best friend to the suspect. Okay, but of course, once the suspect confesses, the officer is no longer the best friend. Okay, because actually they're then going to use that confession against them to convict them for the crime. These interrogations might go on for hours, and so the person might be tired, might be hungry, might be afraid. Um, the police can hold you in custody for 24 hours right before deciding whether to make a charge or not. Um, the recommendations are that police interrogations last no more than four hours, okay? But what we find is in cases of false confessions, they exceed four hours by quite a lot, okay? And so, well, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you guess. Um, in cases of false confessions, on average, how long do you think the police interrogation lasted? If the recommendation is four hours? 12, 20, oh, okay. anyone else? Yeah. 16, so almost as bad as the, the 20, and so, yeah. And um, so 16 hours, okay, is the average length of interrogations in cases of false confessions, okay? So four times the recommend recommendation. It's not hard to imagine that one might be sleep deprived, disoriented, disorientated after 16 hours of continuous questioning, okay? Especially if they were picked up by police late at night, okay, and they're already maybe 
already tired and so on. Um, and then already feeling sleep deprived, but then there's then a 16 hour interrogation. If they're believing that the short term benefits, um, such as being released from the interview, outweigh the long term costs. So, you know, in many of these cases, they're convincing themselves that it's all going to be worked out later on. You know, I'm innocent. I'm not actually going to be convicted in a court of law. Okay. If I just say what they want me to say right now, it'll all sort itself out. Okay. Further down the line. And then also, if the police use leading questions. Okay. So, you know, leading the interview in a particular direction or trying to put words in the mouth of the suspect. So, for example, tell me what happened at the King's Head on evening of October 31st, rather than just asking the more open question, where were you on October 31st? So, by just answering that first question, you've insinuated that you were at that location, even if you haven't already said that you were at that location, okay? And then this might be used to back you into a corner later on, okay? Police might say, well, you told me this earlier on. Were you lying when you said that? You don't want to look like a liar, do you? Okay, and then once you're feeling like you have to stick to that story, okay, then you're more likely to try and then make up answers um, further down the line. So that's the most frequent type of false confessions, okay? These coerced, pressured um, compliance false confessions. The rarest, but also the scariest, is coerced, pressured, internalized false confessions, in which one actually becomes convinced of their guilt during the interrogation. Um, so Gudgeson has put forward a few vulnerable um, vulnerabilities here. First of all, those who have a history of abusing substances or something else that might impact typical brain functioning. Okay. Um, the inability for people to detect discrepancies between what's actually been observed and what's been suggested to them, which is basically a source monitoring error, okay? A source monitoring error is when you cannot accurately monitor the source of a piece of information, okay? Was it something you heard from a friend? Was it something that you watched in the news? Was it something you actually experienced, okay? Some people are more vulnerable to making these mistakes than others, for example, young children, okay? We'll talk about this in the fourth module when we talk about child witnesses. But for example, a young child might mix up whether something was read in a story or whether it actually happened to them, okay? It's not uncommon for them to um, make an error over the source of a piece of information. And then factors that may impact mental states, okay? If you're severely anxious, okay, so much so that you can't think clearly, okay, you can't remember the details clearly. Um, if you're feeling incredibly confused or maybe feeling very guilty, with some, you know, high degree of emotional arousal, okay, during the situation, that may severely impact your ability to think clearly. Now, a couple of examples. Um, Paul Ingram was a minister from here in South Carolina. Um, he was accused by his daughters of sexual assault. Um, initially, he said it was a fabrication, but the family convinced him to go under hypnosis, okay, to make sure that he wasn't lying. So a member of his church volunteered to do the hypnosis, okay, who had been a trained hypnotist. And then after this process of being hypnotized, he actually came out of it being convinced that he was guilty, that he suddenly could remember sexually assaulting his daughters. But eventually the confession was put into doubt when the stories of the children really didn't match with one another and also didn't match up with um, the testimonies from other family members and so on. Um, a case that illustrates why hypnosis should only be used carefully under some situations. The APA here in the US says that psychologists can only use hypnosis if it's to enhance memories that already exist, okay? Psychologists, according to the APA, cannot use hypnosis to uncover memories of something that doesn't already exist, okay? 
If you can't remember it, you can't undergo hypnosis according to the APA, okay? This is because we know it's very easy to plant false memories on, during the process of hypnosis, okay? One is more vulnerable, okay, to falsely believing something that didn't actually happen. And then the case of Billy Wayne Coop is an unusual one, but it's, it's often brought up as one of the clearest examples of in, injustice here in modern America. Um, but his daughter had been sexually assaulted and murdered, and he was being interviewed by police. He wasn't initially a suspect. There was no evidence to suggest that he might be even somewhat responsible. But police thought he was quite an unusual person you know, during this interview. He didn't have much of an emotional reaction, and he just didn't really seem like a typical person. So they then began to think that maybe he's guilty, and so they then put the pressure on him and tried to get a confession. Um, and then they also told his wife that they had witnesses who put him at the crime scene and could say that he was responsible and convinced her that he was responsible and told her that you should go in and convince him that he is responsible and to confess to us. And so she did do this and then he said, um, okay, I'll take a polygraph. So he took a polygraph, which is a lie detector machine that we'll talk about more next time. He passed the polygraph, but police told him he failed the polygraph. Um, and so his response was, well, I must have done it, okay? And so it's an unusual case because after that, he seemed to be convinced that he was responsible. He even took them to the home where the murder took place and walked them through it, did a walk through of the crime scene saying exactly what had happened in, in order. Um, so it's one of those cases that you think, well, how on earth could that happen? But eventually there was evidence um, found from the actual culprit, um, there was a DNA match, okay, for the semen that was left behind at the crime scene. So eventually they did have the actual person who was responsible, okay? But it does seem that he was convinced, at least for a brief period of time, that he was actually responsible for this crime. Sadly, his wife passed away shortly after he confessed, okay? So she died thinking that her husband was you know, responsible for this heinous crime, the sexual assault and murder of their own child. <clears throat> Some other risk factors for internalization. If one has a memory distrust syndrome, it's a pretty rare syndrome, but it's when one doesn't trust their own memory, okay? And so, the, of course, they're therefore more likely to rely upon the testimony of others, okay? If you said I did that, then I must have done it because I can't really remember myself. Um, and disassociation. Now, we're all likely to experience this association at some point, okay? It's when, you know, you retreat into your head and you're no longer really consciously aware. You know, sometimes when you do a drive that you do frequently enough, you kind of just zone out and you don't really remember the entire drive. Or maybe you're reading a book and you're beginning to get incredibly tired and you don't remember the page that you just read, okay, because you're kind of zoning out or times in which you go on autopilot, right? Maybe you're in the shower, for example, and you're just lost in your own thoughts, just kind of going on autopilot, and then you forget if you wash your hair, for example, or something like that. Um, now, some people experience disassociation more than others, okay? They're more likely to experience a disassociation disorder, okay, in which they're then unable really to, to tell the difference between fact and fiction because they're so used to retreating from conscious awareness. And um, poor source monitoring, which I mentioned, okay, a source monitoring error, not being able to accurately place the source of a piece of information. And then if one is repeatedly in interviewed or repeatedly interrogated, you know, obviously then the details of the crime scene are become becoming more and more salient, more and more familiar, okay? And if one also has one of these other risk factors, <clears throat> it therefore might be easier to convince them that this actually happens, this is what they experience. Because the details are becoming so fresh in their minds, okay, because they're experiencing these prolonged interrogations multiple times concerning the details. And then the length of the interview is undoubtedly a risk factor, 
Okay. Um, so I, I told you it's advised that police interrogations last no more than four hours. But when looking at cases of um, false confessions, 34% had lasted between six and 12 hours, 39% between 12 and 14, and the average was 16.3 for cases of false confessions. So four times the standard recommendation. Linked to this is the fact that if one is being interrogated for 16 hours, they're going to be sleep deprived. And we know that sleep deprivation causes impairments in brain functioning, okay? If you're sleep deprived, you're not thinking as clearly, the prefrontal cortex is not as active as a functional as it typically is, okay? Meaning that your executive functions are impaired, okay, during this state of sleep deprivation. I'll, I'll tell you about one more case briefly. Um, this is Marty Tankliff. In 1989, he was accused when he was 17 um, of murdering his parents, um, despite, despite any absence against him. He denied the charges for several hours until his interrogator told him his hair was found in the grass of his mother. It was a lie, okay? That wasn't true. Um, and his hospitalized father had came out of his coma to say that Marty was responsible. Another lie, his father died in the coma. He never regains consciousness. Um, following these lies, Marty confessed, thinking that the evidence was strong against him, um, though he did immediately recant, okay? So this is a case of coerced or pressured compliance, falsely confessing. Um, and then he was convicted purely on this basis. Okay, there was no other evidence put forward during the trial. He was convicted based upon this confession, even though the defense argued that it had been coerced. Okay, but like I say, it's persuasive evidence for jurors. And then the charges were finally dismissed 19 years later, and he was um, declared innocent. And he now works as a lawyer helping to make sure other vulnerable defendants, okay, don't end up in the same situation as he ended up in. So testing false confessions in the lab is obviously very difficult because we can never match the consequences of confessing to a crime in real life, okay? The ecological validity therefore is limited, okay? For the purposes of an experiment, we can't, we can't convince a participant that they're confessing to murdering their parents and that they're going to go to jail for this, right? No matter what the situation is in a lab experiment, the participants know that once the experiment is over, they're free to go and there's not really going to be any long-term consequences. But nevertheless, a lot of researchers have tried to study what makes false confessions more likely to occur, even in the lab, which then might pinpoint some risk factors, okay, that we can then investigate further in relation to real cases. So here's a typical scenario of how this is done. So participants are told, type letters that are read out to them, some at a slow pace, some at a fast pace. Obviously, the fast pace is more cognitively demanding. And they're told, avoid pressing the Alt key, okay? The alt key will crash the computer, okay? It will ruin the experiment. It will lose all of the data, okay? But of course, the computer is timed to crash, okay? Regardless of them not pressing the alt key, okay? It's going to happen anyway. And then the purpose of the study unknown to the participants is the researchers want to know, can they get the participant to falsely confessing to pressing the alt key and claiming responsibility for losing the experimenter's data and ruining the experiment. Um, sometimes they might hear false witness testimony. So, well, we know you pressed the alt key, someone just saw you press it, okay? And sometimes that doesn't occur, but then we can see the impact of that. Um, and at the end, participants are asked, sign a confession, claiming responsibility. Now, at the very least here, we have evidence of a compliant false confession if they sign this confession. But then also, once they leave, they're asked by a confederate, what happened? 
they think this confederate is just another participant, okay? But actually, it's someone in on the experiment. If once they think the experiment's over and outside the lab, they tell this person that they accidentally pressed the alt key and ruined the experiment, then that means it's internalized, okay? It's not just a compliance false confession, it's actually an internalized one. Now, if the task is more difficult, unsurprising, both types of confessions are increased in frequency, okay? So when the words are read out at a faster pace, okay, when the situation is more cognitively demanding, okay, it's more likely then one will falsely confess. Um, and unsurprising also, if there's witness testimony, false witness testimony, they're more likely also um, to both give internalized and compliant false confessions. So, you know, you can imagine some individuals who in this sort of scenario, you know, might be convinced, okay, that they actually pressed this. They're, they're likely to doubt their own memory and not very confident maybe, and more likely to think that, well, if all this evidence is saying that I did it, I must have done it and I must just not have realized it. Um, now this design has been replicated even when there's some financial costs to confessing, okay? So maybe the participants are getting a reward, okay, for taking part in the experiment. That's why they signed up. But if they confess to ruining the experiment, they'll no longer get the reward, okay? And they know this, okay? They know by confessing, they'll, they'll miss out on the financial incentive that was promised. And we still get the significant findings, okay, that these factors increase the likelihood of falsely confessing, um, even when they're losing this financial reward. Now, obviously, we have to be somewhat creative here in trying to come up with possible consequences that are ethical, okay? Because like I say, we can't mirror real life, okay? We can't have people think that they're actually going to prison for the, for the um, incident that's just occurred. So in North America, the read technique is the most frequently used interrogation strategy by police. This is typically how police are trained. Thankfully, I would say some states are already leaving behind the read technique and using other techniques. But for the most part, most of North America still uses the read technique. Um, the read technique has three stages to it. The first one is to gather evidence, okay? So this would be before interviewing the person, okay? So you actually know what evidence there is, okay? So you know what occurred, what the evidence is telling you. And then conducting a non-accusatorial interview. Um, so asking the person for some background on the victim, um, asking them where they were and so on. And then trying to assess deception over guilt. So where were you on the night of the crime? Okay, and then police are told at this second stage of the read technique, they have to make a decision. Is the person telling the truth, in which case ends the interview, or are they telling a lie? And if they're telling a lie, then police, according to the read technique, should go to the third stage. The goal of the third stage is to get a confession. That's the goal, okay? The goal is to not, the goal isn't, for example, find out what happened or get to the truth of the matter, okay? The goal is to get a confession. And there is a number of strategies used for the third stage for the purposes of getting that confession. Now, this all rests on the notion that police can tell the difference between a truth and a lie, okay? That's the basic assumption behind it, that the third stage is only going to be used on guilty perpetrators who have been determined as being lying to the police. But as I'll talk about more next time, that's highly problematic as an assumption, okay? Because what we find is when we ask police and other lay people to tell the difference between whether this is a truth or a lie, the success rate is about 50%, okay? In fact, when we look at different groups, so students, psychologists, police, lay people, the group who scores the worst again and again is actually police, okay? Their success rate is more like 40%. That's because they're more likely to over-report the number of lies and under-report the number of truths. Now, that's not too surprising because in their their day-to-day -day professional life, they come into contact with more lies than the typical person does, okay? They do experience more people lying to them. 
So it makes sense that they might then come to over predict the number of lies that are being told to them at these sorts of studies that we're talking about. So it's understandable, but it's still an issue that the Rita technique is using this assumption, okay, to then go forward to the third stage. The third stage, like I say, therefore then has the goal of getting a confession. And there's nine tactics or nine sub stages, okay, that are to be used to get this confession. Now, most of these nine sub stages can be split under minimization or maximization. There's a couple that don't neatly fit. So one of them, one of the nine is that the suspect must have their attention on police at all times. So if the suspect is drifting off or their attention is no longer on police, the Rita technique says to slam the desk or to get up close or do something that again gets their attention on them. Another substage is that the suspect can never declare their innocence. Okay. If they're about to say that they're innocent, police are instructed to interrupt them. Okay. So that it's not on the record. Okay. That there's no um, verbal um, claim of being innocent. The other seven can pretty much be classed as either minimization or maximization. So either this good cop technique or this bad cop technique. Okay. So the good cop technique is the minimization, building rapport, victim blaming, promising rewards, okay? Um, and then the maximization is the bad cop, the scare tactics, okay? Trying to scare them into confessing. Now, like I say, the Ritz technique is still the most frequently used interrogation strategy in North America, with only a couple of states already moving it behind and going into different directions. Um, and so the strategies that are suggested by the Rita technique are unsurprisingly frequent as well. Okay. In one study, over 600 North American detectives were given a questionnaire asking them which of these behaviors do they use. Um, they were more likely than not to pretend to have independent evidence of guilt so to pretend to have witness statements or DNA evidence or fingerprints or something else that they didn't actually have. They were more likely than not to isolate the suspect deliberately from friends and family to get a confession, to establish rapport, to, guilt, to build trust with the suspect, which on its own might not be problematic, but if it's misused and we're talking about a vulnerable person who's a young child or intellectually impaired, then obviously that can be highly problematic. To offer sympathy or moral justification, which is minimization, to interrupt any denials, one of those stages by the Reed technique, and to appeal to the suspect's self interest. So, overall, they were more likely to report using minimization techniques than maximization. But keep in mind, these are, these are self reports, okay? And the self reports are finding that they're more likely than not to do these. You would expect that using more independent measurements other than self-reports, the numbers would likely be higher rather than lower. So the Reed technique has a number of issues connected to it. First of all, it's working under the assumption that investigators can tell the difference between a person who's telling a lie and a person who's telling a truth even though the evidence just doesn't back up that assumption. It also increases the chances that one will ask questions in a more biased way, that they won't, for example, pose questions that may explore an alternative theory, okay? If the interrogator thinks that this person is guilty, okay, then they're more likely to ask questions that are going to get the answers that they want, okay, to unearth that this person is guilty rather than have a more neutral, non-accusatorial strategy of interviewing, which might open up other avenues for exploring and might open up possible alternative theories and might be more likely to get to the actual truth if this person is actually innocent. And we also know that the Reed technique increases the chances of false confessions. In comparison to other police interview strategies, the Reed technique comes with it a higher rate of false confessions.
The second one shouldn't be surprising because even in less extreme situations, if you have a preconceived notion over what happened, that's obviously going to influence the questions that you ask that person, right? And in a number of studies, if we have interviewers, for example, who have some information that might skew their opinion one way or the other versus interviewers who don't have any prior knowledge, the questions they ask are very different, okay? Their strategy of interviewing is very different. One is more accusatorial, one is more neutral in tone, okay? So because of these problems with the Reed's technique, there's been a number of suggestions over alternative practices. Um, like I say, some states are already moving in that direction. Um, one that's often suggested is the peace model developed in England and Wales. So the stages of this are, first of all, planning, which is like the first stage of the Reed's technique, okay? gathering evidence okay before going into the interview so you know what the evidence is and what happened or what the evidence suggests happened and so on the second stage engage and explain so explain the purposes for the interview why the person is here try to build some rapport make them feel a bit more comfortable and then third stage to conduct an interview to get an account in neutral tone in a non-accusatorial way okay that's more open-ended rather than leading and it's more likely therefore to explore possible alternatives as well to then bring the interview to a close asking if there's anything they want to clear up um, and then evaluating the contents of the interview and then making a decision based upon that whether they should continue pursuing this person as a suspect or whether they should explore some other alternative so the peace model is often brought up as the most ethical, if you like, um, approach to police interviews. <clears throat> and it would be described as a investigative interview rather than an interrogation, okay? Because an interrogation comes with it, a number of negative connotations, okay? Which really do characterize the Reed's technique. Now, you, I'm, you know, when I talk about a more ethical approach to interviewing a a suspect obviously the the goal here is to not make it more difficult to convict someone who's actually guilty okay but the point here is that someone should be assumed innocent until they're proved guilty right and that there should be a somewhat level playing field okay in which if one is a suspect they are able to put across their own narrative um, before actually being convicted. Whereas with the Reed's technique, it kind of tilts or skews the game so that it's in favor of the police and so that the suspect is at a disadvantage, okay, which increases maybe then their likelihood of being convicted, even if they're actually innocent. So how else might false confessions be minimized? We could video record interviews. This is not mandated at a federal level, but a number of states, pretty much all states now in the US have some sort of rule regarding that police interviews, police interrogations should be interviewed, should be video recorded. Now, obviously this means that ideally the jury should hear not just the confession and the description of the interrogation according to police, but they can actually watch it for themselves. And if there's any obvious issues of pressure or co um, being coerced, they can see it themselves in the video. Um, and this would hopefully give them a better idea and then be less likely to convict this person if it was a, you know, not ideal interview. But I'll say that there are, should I say, workarounds or loopholes because even in the states in which there are rules over interrogations being recorded, if there is technical difficulties or the video is accidentally erased or there is some issue that disrupts the recording, okay, the contents of the interview according to police can still be used at trial and the confession can still also be used at trial, okay? So 
in reality, it's more like the intent to record has to be um, has to be present. We could suggest more ethical interviewing strategies like the piece model rather than the read technique. We could increase awareness over the individual risk factors, the vulnerabilities that make one more likely to falsely confess. So educating police and detectives and so on over the fact that those who are younger or those with a lower IQ and so on are more likely to falsely confess and so should have more precautions um, to help such as an adult, um, an appropriate adult. Or maybe we should require um, cooperation. So rather than purely convicting someone on a confession, maybe it should be cooperated by additional evidence. Um, and then maybe jury training, which would be educating them on the fact that false confessions occur and under what circumstances they're likely to occur. So if nine out of 10 jury members think that false confessions never happened, when in fact they happen in 25% of wrongful imprisonment cases, then you could argue that there's some education there that needs to be done. And that could be a psychologist giving expert testimony in the trial. It could be an instructional video that's like a mini lecture telling them some of the basics on false confessions and the risk factors. And it would still be the jury who look at the evidence for themselves, no more educated and think, do these risk factors appear in this case? What was talked about, does it apply to this case? Does this look like it was a good interview? Does this confession look like it can be trusted? Or is there an increased likelihood of it being false based upon what I've, le what I've learned? <clears throat> okay, and then here's just your main review points. Okay, if there's any questions, ask. Otherwise, thanks everyone, I'll see you next time.